Five, six, seven, eight, right? That's where we're going. Everyone agree? <laughs> Now, last week, we made a curious statement that Plotinus understands his very fine mystical experiences in terms of Platonic thought or Neoplatonic thought, but that he is not a Platonist. <clears throat> we made the point that he draws his metaphysics pretty much out of the Timaeus. And now that curious, thank you, thank you. It's uh, gin, by the way. Yeah, pure. it's straight. Nothing wrong with that. So look here, how can we say that Plotinus is not a Platonist? So first we have to see how he makes this connection between what is happening to the soul as it enters the body and it struggles in the body and how he understands that. So we're into section five, are we not? Take a look. Descent of the soul. Notice he picks up the theme that this world soul is universal. Then how is it that they are particular souls? Right, how come? What is the relationship then between these? That's his first question. Second is its entrance into the body. Take a look at the way he opens five. See whether you agree. But on this supposition, how can there be one soul that is yours, a second soul that is another man's, and a third that is yet another's? In the lower order, are they, are, are they souls of particular individuals yet in the higher order of souls? that of the higher unity? Ah, what does this mean? This would mean that Socrates would exist as long as Socrates' soul is in the body and would cease to exist when he attains perfection. Okay, what did he just say? Hmm. All right, that's all. Great part. I'm sorry, where are you? Yeah. I'm on page 132, section 5, in Descent to the Soul. Section 5. So upon perfection, really. Upon perfection, really. We've done it. Yeah. Upon perfection, really. yeah. upon perfection which is true. Would you not agree it's universally the truth that anyone who ever experiences enlightenment, at that very moment, they die? <clears throat> Is that right? right? Is that true? <laughs> don't they, to, yes. they all drop dead, don't they, as soon as they gain enlightenment? You mean they lose their physical body? Is, is that right? Is, is no, that true? Body. Yeah, is that true, isn't it? They lose everything about it. Let me make sure. I just need to get where you are because the descent of the soul is on... Section 5 is on 67 in my book, and that's not what... Right. Well, I don't mind 67. No, no I, I, just, I can't find where you just live. Oh, excuse me. You're at a thousand percent correct. Would you be kind enough to read 5? I was on the soul on page 132. That's another section. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. This is another section. So, which one do you want? So again, she's right. I just, just an astonishing <laughs> record. Must have brains. Uh -oh. Could you read it for us, please? And that'll put me back on track. <clears throat> so we're going to go to the descent of the soul? Yeah, I, I like that I section, like, too. Like dying yeah, 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 yeah. There is no contradiction between the sowing to birth and the willing descent for the perfection of the whole. 
between justice and the cave, between necessity and free choice. Necessity includes free choice. Okay, we're going to look at this 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 problem. Okay, and there it is. Same problem. <clears throat> Perfection is here in the realm of the intelligible world. Soul participates in the intelligible. <clears throat> There's no contradiction between the sowing of, to birth and the willing descent for the perfection of the whole. <coughs> now watch this proposition go right in a very strange way throughout this entire thing. Please go on. Between justice and the cave, between necessity and free choice, necessity includes free choice. Being in the body and be, being in the body being an evil. teachings of Empedocles, the flight from God in the wandering and the sin that is justly punished, <clears throat> nor in that of Heraclitus, the repose that is flight. In general, willing descent that is also unwilling. Everything that becomes worse does so unwillingly. Yet, when it becomes so through inherent tendency, that submission to the lower can be regarded as a penalty. Then, too, these experience and act, experiences and acts are determined by an eternal law of nature, so that it may be said, without being either inconsistent or untruthful, that a soul that descends from the world above to some lower being is sent by the divinity. For final effects, however far removed by intermediate effects, are always to be referred back to the starting point. There are two wrongs the soul commits. The first is its descent. The second, the evil done after arrival here below. The first is punished by the very condition of its descent. Punishment for the second is passage once more into other bodies, there to remain at greater or less length according to the judgment of its deserts. The word judgment indicates that this takes place as a result of divine law. If, however, its perversity goes beyond all measure, the soul incurs an even more severe penalty administered by avenging demons. Thus, too, the soul enters body. Although its nature is divine and its realm the intelligible. A lesser divinity, it is impelled by the stress of its powers and the attraction of governing the next below it. By voluntary inclination, it plunges into this sphere. If it returns quickly, it will have suffered no harm in thus learning of evil and of what sin is, in bringing its powers into manifest play, in exhibiting activities and achievements that, remaining merely potentialities in the intelligible realm, might as well never have been if they were never meant to be actualized. <coughs> The soul itself would never really know these suppressed, inhibited potencies. Potencies are revealed by acts, for potencies in themselves are hidden and undetectable, and for all practical purposes, non-existent. As it is, all now marvel at the inner greatness of the soul exteriorly, exteriorly revealed in the richness of its acts.
Okay. Would you agree? <clears throat> There's a certain perfection in the intelligible, and the problem is that there are two wrongs. The first wrong is the dissent. The dissent is wrong. The incarnation, that's its mistake. And the second one is once in the body, when it acts, second set of wrongs, two kinds of wrongs. <laughs> oh, good, good. Yeah. Hey, would you go further and say, on the bottom of page 67, thus too, the soul enters body. Although its nature is divine, and its realm the untouchable, a lesser divinity, it is impelled by the stress of its powers, the attraction of governing the next below it. Hey. What's its condition? Stress. It's got a very interesting stress of its powers. It's got powers. All right, what's it going to do with its powers? Govern. Govern. That's what it's doing. It's going into the body to govern. It's attracted to govern. By voluntary inclination, it plunges into this sphere. If it returns quickly, it will have suffered no harm and uh, thus learning uh, of evil. Look here, see, you're learning something. You're learning evil. So if you only live one day, whew, that's good. <laughs> right? It's enough. Out of here. That's enough. You've learned enough about evil. Because evil is the descent. Mm -hmm. The descent itself. By voluntary inclination, it plunges into the sphere. If it returns quickly, yeah, only quickly, it will have suffered no harm, and thus learning of evil, and what sin is. All right? Ah! Hey. Learns the evil, and what sin is. That's amartya, right? Amartya. Yeah. Yeah, good, good. in bringing its powers into manifest play, in exhibiting activities and achievement, that remaining merely potentialities in the intelligible realm might as well never have been if they never meant to be actualized. The soul itself would never know these suppressed, inhibited potencies potencies revealed by acts. For potencies in themselves are hidden and undetectable, and for all practical purposes non-existent. As it is, all now marvel at the inner greatness of the soul exteriorly revealed in the richness of its acts. <clears throat> Would you agree we have something rather strange? We have his view up to this point what it learns is evil, and then he has a discussion of actuality and potentiality. <clears throat> and in this section, how does it look? Is there a difference as you compare the two? Because if it goes, if it's never born, then whatever is to act, see, it's going to act, right? If it's going to act, there's something that it has to develop. Therefore, it, it was previously only there potentially. <clears throat> right, only potentially. Right. Is that the learning of evil? Pardon? Is that the learning of evil? What? The learning of evil. Yes. Is that, right. is that potential? He's talking about it. I, I just. Yes, yeah, I thought maybe you'd add to what you're saying. 
Well, no. the, the, the issue for me is that's not what the Phaedrus says. That's not... It's not what it talks about in the Phaedrus. I think it was a Platonist. Oh, well, exactly. he's not a Platonist. That's right. It's claptrap. <laughs> <laughs> and we need your help on the Phaedrus. We need to clap. <coughs> in just a minute. Can we hold it and pull yeah. in the Phaedrus? Yeah. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Look, all motion, all motion... Uh, Motion brings something into existence, does it not? Right, anything in motion. Something develops, something emerges, something changes. Agree? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, all motion is nothing other than the actualization of what was potential. Right, all action, all motion can be explained by these two ideas. So all motion is the actualization of what lies potential. Therefore, if there's no act, <clears throat> nothing will emerge, no manifestation. Potencies are revealed by acts, right? To get it out. For potencies in themselves are hidden and undetectable, non-existence for all practical purposes. As it is now, now, as it is, all now marvel at the inner greatness of the soul. I revealed in the arts. But wait a minute. Is there a clash here between? Now, right, as it is, all now marvel at the inner greatness of the soul, exteriorly revealed in the richness of its acts. If its acts end up being Does that create a tension between two expressions? Yeah. Let's watch the way he develops it. And this is where he's going to explore anything that has any kind of status has to produce. There has to be a production. So now we're going into six. And would you agree we need a volunteer to read? Don't you think? All right. Okay, John. The one must not be solely the solitary. If it were, reality would remain buried and shapeless, since in the one there is no differentiation of forms. No beings would exist if the one remained shut up in itself. More than that, the multiplicity of beings issued from the one would not exist as they do if there did not issue from the one those beings that are in the rank of souls. Likewise, souls must not play the solitaries, their issue stifled. Every nature must produce its next, for each thing must unfold, seed-like from indivisible principle, into a visible effect. Principle continues unaltered in its proper place. What unfolds from it is the product of the inexpressible power that resides in it. It must not stay this power, and as though jealous limit its effect. It must proceed continuously until all things, to the very last, have within the limits of possibility come forth. All is the result of this immense power, giving its gifts to the universe, unable to let any part remain without its share. <clears throat> Nothing hinders anything from sharing in the good to the extent it is able. That statement holds true even for matter. If, on the one hand, matter is assumed to have existed from all eternity, it is impossible that, having existence, it should not have a share in that which, in accord with each receptivity, communicates the good to all. If, on the other hand, matter is held to be the necessary consequence of anterior causes, it will not be separated from this principle either as though, having graciously given it existence, it was powerless to reach it. The excellence 
the power and the goodness of the intelligible realm is revealed in what is most excellent in the realm of sense. For the realms are linked together, from the one, self-existent, the other eternally draws its, its existence by participation and to the extent it reproduces the intelligible by imitation. <coughs> Is there a difference between five and six? In section six, is there any idea of evil and sin? How does it how does it differ? Go on, put it into words. Take a look at what you're saying. <clears throat> Every nature must produce its next, right? Take a look at that. Um, <clears throat> well, in terms of the last line. You know, to the extent it reproduces the intelligible by imitation. Yeah. Okay, isn't that the, the key, you know, to the generation that he's talking about? And in the in the last in five, he's saying, you know, it's impelled into this condition of the material world. Mm -hmm. So how can it be, uh, you know, impelled? And then in the next one be imitating the good. No. That makes no sense. No. 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 I, no. I Jump in. in. In 5 itself, it says, um, a soul that descends from the world above to some lower being is sent by the divinity. No. So there's an internal conflict in yes. 5 itself. Yes, there is. No. There's a conflict going into five mm -hmm. and, and between five and six. Good. Do you, would you agree this is a good reason there's a section called seven? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Loud. As there are these two realms, the intelligible and that of sense, it is better for the soul to dwell in the intelligible. But such is its nature, it is necessary that it also live in the realm of sense. Accordingly, it occupies only an intermediate rank. Yet there is no cause for complaint that it is not in all respects the highest. By nature divine, it is located at the nethermost limit of the intelligible realm, bordering on the realm of sense, and there gives to the realm of sense something of its own. In turn, it is itself affected when, instead of controlling the body without endangering its own security, it lets itself be carried away by an excessive zeal and plunges deep into the body and ceases to be wholly united to the soul. Yet the soul can rise above this condition again and, turning to account the experience of what it has seen and suffered here below, can better appreciate the life that is above and can know more clearly what is the better by contrast with its opposite? Indeed, knowledge of good is sharpened by experience of evil in those incapable of any sure knowledge of evil unless they have experienced it. Mm -hmm. For the intelligence, to reason discursively is to descend to its lowest level rather than to rise to the level of the existence beyond. But it cannot remain within itself. Of necessity it produces. Of necessity, then, by the very law of its nature, it proceeds to the level of the soul. It goes, it goes no further, entrusting the later stages of being to the soul. It returns once more to the intelligible realm. For the soul, it is much the same. Its lowest act is the realm of sense, its highest contemplation of the supernal beings. For individual souls, this contemplation is fragmentary and divided by time. So their conversion begins on a lower level. But the soul never becomes involved in the activities of the lower world. When you the evil, it comprehends intellectually what is below it while always cleaving to what is above it. Therefore, it is able at one and the same time to be debtor to what is above, and since as soul it cannot escape touching the sphere, benefactor to what is below. 
Would you agree we have a discussion here of these three realms? And remember, when you use the capital S, that's world soul. Now, in this paragraph, can you describe, can you point out where he talks about small s and why he thinks, well, hold on. First, would you agree there is a section clearly where he's talking about the soul, capital S, to intelligible, soul to soul, soul to body. I'm interested where in this section does he then make the point that there's a particular advantage of the particular soul experiencing what it does? Can you then describe that advantage it gains by its descent? It's just the contrast. Got a section to read? Got a quote? Yeah. Um, indeed, knowledge of good. Louder. Indeed. Knowledge of good is sharpened by experience of evil in those incapable of any sure knowledge of evil unless they have experienced it. Mm. Um. Go on, someone else? More? Yet the soul can rise above this condition again and turning to account the experience of what it has seen and suffered here below can better appreciate the life that is above and can know more clearly what is the better by contrast with its opposite. Next sentence, two of them. <clears throat> That's Anne Marie's. Indeed, knowledge of good is sharpened by experience of evil and those incapable of any sure knowledge of evil unless they have experienced it. Thank you. Put the two together. Yet, the soul can and rise above the condition again and turning to account the experience of what it has seen and suffered here below, it can appreciate better, see? It can better appreciate the life that is above and can know more clearly what is the better by contrast with its opposite. What does he gain by the descent? To know more clearly. What? The nature of what is above, the no. contrast with what is above. You can appreciate it better. <laughs> appreciate it. And it said, didn't it say no more clearly? That's I have a different text. So yes, I'm no, gonna... yes, please use it. Uh, yes, please, go ahead. No, no, go. Well, with, okay, in this text it says, especially as it is possible for it to emerge again, having acquired the whole story of what it saw and experienced here, and learn what it is like to be there. And by the comparison of things which are, in a way, opposites, opposite, learning, in a way, more clearly, the better things. For the experience of evil is a clearer knowledge of the good. Ah, do it again? That's pretty strong, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. For the experience of evil is a clearer knowledge of the good. Yes. For those whose power is too weak to know evil, with clear intellectual certainly, certainty before experiencing it. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Indeed, knowledge of good is sharpened by experience of evil. Right? Knowledge of good is sharpened. <clears throat> I'm sharpened. Right? That's a good way of putting it. And gnosis is, and our guest at home, more shiny. <clears throat> um, Pierre, is, is that sort of, Pierre, is that sort of like if I see the color yellow, I know so cool. more by seeing the color red? <clears throat> no, as long as you're willing to say that one is greatly more than the other, <laughs> yeah. It's also good that the way to feel good is to get someone to beat you up because when they stop, you feel better. Uh, yeah, this is a... called the ghetto principle. Mm. The ghetto principle. <laughs> this is a rather strong statement, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Knowledge of good. You see, what's, it's really interesting. 
Um, <clears throat> not the good. Thank goodness there's no definite article there. Right? Knowledge of it is sharpened. Perhaps it sharpens the vision. It sharpens the vision so that you know where the boundary is. Yeah. Yeah. And it's by the one that you gain a sharper vision of the other. That's his position. Hold on. <coughs> yes, you were going to add? But <clears throat> he qualifies the statement by saying that it's uh, in those capable, I'm sorry, in those incapable of any sure knowledge of evil unless they have experience. No. So it's not necessarily for everyone. Okay. Would you agree he's got a problem? He knows it. He's going to settle it and aid. I hope so. Well, he's going to offer an explanation. Shall I put it that way? Okay. okay. And, uh... <clears throat> Once you touch the tar baby, I don't think you can turn it loose. Did you th th it's, okay. We'll, we'll try it in a minute. <clears throat> Didn't you read it? Sure. Three. Give it a ba-ba. Hey. No, well, it's somebody else. I'm going to throw it. Okay, someone else. Okay. Going, going, going. Good. Good. Okay. This now goes counter to current belief. That's but right. But let us take our courage in our hands and say it. No soul, not even our own, enters into the body completely. Soul always remains united by its higher part to the intelligible realm. But if the part that is in the realm of sense dominates, or rather becomes dominated and disturbed, it keeps us unaware of what the higher part of the soul contemplates. Indeed, we are aware of what the soul contemplates only if the content descends to the level of sensation. We do not know what happens in any part of the soul until it becomes present to the entire soul. For instance, an appetite does not become known to us as long as it remains in the faculty of desire. We detect it only when we perceive it by interior sense or by the act of judgment or by both. Every soul has a lower part directed towards the bodily and a higher part directed towards the intelligible. The soul, effortlessly, manages the universe by that part directed towards the bodily. For the soul governs the bodily not by discursive reasoning, as we do, but by intuition, much as is done in the arts. Individual souls each of which manages a part of the universe, also have a higher phase. But they are preoccupied with sensation and its impressions. Much they perceive is contrary to nature and troubles and confuses them. This is so because the body in their care is deficient, hedged about with alien influences, filled with desires, deceived in its very pleasures. Yet there is a part of the soul insensitive to the lure of these passing pleasures whose living is correspondent to its reality. What's his uh, solution? Mm -hmm. That you can't talk about the particular soul doing what he says it is doing wholly because a part of it resides in the intelligible. Therefore, he's only talking about this part that seeks to govern and rule the body and act, and in acting and descending into body this part, <coughs> then it participates in evil and discovers what sin is. That's what he's doing? Okay. Now... <coughs> Did you, did you tell Lyndon to get coffee? 
I suggest we, this is when we need him. <laughs> I didn't suggest okay, it now. let's throw it open, all right? Okay? Mm -hmm. What do you see? How do you want to look at this? Jump in. Is I have a question which which I don't know who can answer it, but you know that the idea of sin mm -hmm. is that concept hamartia, which is missing the mark, right? No. Yeah. So but I guess I have in front of me the con you know how we we saw that in the this is a parallel in the New Testament that the idea of doxe be, became the idea of glory, the glory of mm -hmm. right? transfiguration is glory. Yes, no. it's glory. So I guess I'm wondering whether you know or someone knows whether hamartia, the idea of missing the mark, is what's happening here, or a, it's, since it's being translated sin it, at this time, is this sin? I mean, is it has it moved? Is it a Christian? Is it has it? No, yeah, okay. That's the question. Yeah, but <clears throat> in any case, we do know it's connected to evil. Or bad. See, it's kakos, right? Well, it's, bad. So it's not or, evil. It's, I mean, okay. or it is, and that's the question, I guess. Okay, let's it try it this way, then, all right? What if we were to reread it using kakos, which is the word for bad, bad. instead of using evil, mm -hmm. and instead of using the idea of sin, use the idea that, hey, you're missing... You're missing the mark. You're missing what you want to do. Mm -hmm. You're not able to Failing achieve, to achieve or hitting or the target yeah. rather than with the Christian overload of evil and sin, right. which you're pointing out. I'm just wondering whether no, 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 it's where we point, are Because here. this is 270 A.D., and the question is, would he be borrowing a Christian concept at this point or Judeo-Christian exactly. concept of 270? to illuminate what he thinks philosophically. Right. No, 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 no. Good point, good point, good point. So it doesn't make any difference. Because you can still, I guess you should look for the content of it. Um, because it looks like, wouldn't you agree that it looks key that the, there's a, um, it says that the real problem, since part of the soul remains in the higher realm, that the real problem is if you use the lower part of the soul that's engaged with the sense realm to govern. Isn't that the point that was just made? To rule. Right? So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Right? Because that, 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 that looks more platonic. Right? Because that's... Right? That's functioning out of the realm of appearance. The world, the world of becoming. So that's, that's what I have to offer. Well, we're back in section five, in the second paragraph. Mm. <clears throat> All right, could you use your translation, please? She has the lobe. Okay, well, it's not, it's not paragraph. Okay, there are two wrongs the soul uh, commits. That's the first, so it's its descent. The second, the evil done after arrival here below. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, that's very interesting because I have a lot of trouble figuring out where you guys were. Just a second. Okay, and since the sin of the soul can refer to two things. Okay, do it again, please. And since the sin of the soul can refer to two things, ah, either... Just two things. Just two things. Go ahead. Details. Either to the course of the descent or to doing evil when the soul has arrived here below. The punishment of the first is the very experience of descent, and of the lesser degree of the second, the entrance, and a very quick one, into other bodies, <clears throat> according to the judgment passed on, blah, 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 passed on its desserts. Hmm, wait a second. I don't know if you a second. Second punishment. Go ahead. Okay. The, the entrance and a very quick one into other bodies, according to the judgment, passed on its deserts. 
The word judgment indicates what happens by divine decree, but the boundless kind of wickedness is judged to deserve greater punishment in charge of the chast of chastising spirits. So then the soul, though it is divine and comes from above, enters into the body, and though it is a god of the lowest rank, comes to this world by a spontaneous inclination to its own power, sorry, let's see, and though it is a god of the lowest rank, comes to this world by a spontaneous inclination, its own power and the setting in order of what comes after it being the cause of its descent. And therefore, this leads you to. Well, it was. It wasn't actually this passage. It was the one in. Mm -hmm. But they have. They have. In, reading. They have by voluntary inclination rather than spontaneous. Yeah. Which indicates that it's a decision. I didn't hear that, please. I said uh, she has spontaneous inclination, and here it's by voluntary inclination, which means okay. there's still mind to make okay. that decision. Well, it seems that whether it is the, the Christian <coughs> concept of evil and sin, or it is missing the mark, and you've still got like um, <coughs> Um, a, a split, a dual, a dual realm, a good and a bad, or, a, and <clears throat> there's no. It's um, like it's a punishment. It, it's it's a punishment to be here to to make the descent, as opposed to like in the Republic where there's. Therefore, the. The thing that he has to make clear is that the descent here, as he is considering it, is a punishment. Mm -hmm. right. Is that right? Come on, yes or no? Yes, okay. earth itself is bad. I don't see any model copy going on. I mean, I don't see any. Look her. So what he needs, to, what we need to see, <clears throat> we can even drop out evil and sin and drop that out. <laughs> This is what he has to explain. If I only could recall the title of this work, what's it called? Yeah. Descent of the Soul. <laughs> Descent of the Soul. Descent of the Soul. He has to show, we have to find how he understands the Descent of the Soul. That is to say, he has to offer an explanation of why the Soul incarnates or descends into the body. Agree? Mm -hmm. Because from that, all of these other words, whether it's evil or bad or sin or a martyon, is not the thing we want to make clear is why the descent in the first place. Mm -hmm. Since everything that follows from that you can put in this language and it either uses one set of terms or the other. So look here, so we can say, has he answered this? Why the descent? <coughs> Yeah. Come back into the text. Why the descent? Why does he think there's a descent? Individuality. Other than the answer that we came to, the idea of gaining a clearer view of what is above, clearer knowledge, isn't that a reason? It seems like the result. It's not the reason for the descent. It's the effect. It's the effect. Is there a it, it says. I'm, uh, pardon me, I'm not listening. What? Yes, you want to try it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll just offer this that he, um, in the bottom of page 67, he says, Thus, too, the soul enters body, although its nature is divine and its realm is intelligible, a lesser divinity it is impelled by the stress of its powers and the attraction of governing the next below it. Okay. More? Come on. <clears throat> well, he, he has two themes, and this is puzzling to me. In six, he says the one must not be solely the solitary. 
And then he goes in in seven. He says the intelligent for the intelligence <coughs> to reason discursively is to descend to its lowest level rather than to rise. But it cannot remain within itself. Of necessity it produces. Of necessity then by the very law of its nature it proceeds to the level of the soul. Yeah. It sounds like in, in his understanding it's the na by nature it is necessary for that which is higher to produce and to descend. Oh, by to nature descend. it does that. Yeah. And, and in so doing it has also a kind of like I guess a um, Okay. Well, a, cat, a, a disclaimer that you can, if you reflect and, and see that, you can get out of that descent. Okay, let me ask the question then in another way, all right? Would you agree he does have this question, why the descent? Mm -hmm. Would you agree that's in the very first section we read, the first chapter of this section, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then there has come the descent down from intel intellection to the discourse of reason and it leaves me puzzled why this descent section 2 right chapter 2 of that section so in seeking in plato an answer to questions about one's own soul, one is driven to questions about soul in general. How has the soul been brought into association with the body? Then there's this whole discussion, isn't it, about the descent? But, uh, he's puzzled by it. Agree he's puzzled by it? And uh, does he answer it? So it's quite a curious question. The question really is, what would be an answer? What would constitute an answer? Intellectual curiosity. See, if we find shortcomings in his answer, well, we could blame our we could blame the question is too profound. Or we're not reading Plotinus right, and he's telling us, and we can't accept his answer. But, what would constitute an answer? Jump in. One of the one of the preconditions would be if it were necessary or not, whether it was freely done or not, right? Well, for him, it's, it, the dissent is necessary if if the statement he makes that uh, everything must then produce, everything must then generate, and therefore the dissent is generating. But you see, the question is, does that answer it? Is that an answer? Does that constitute an answer? That's certainly one of the conditions for the answer, but does that answer it? Yeah, okay, let's forget it then. <coughs> this is where you come in, I'll come in. Are you talking about the Phaedrus? I think maybe we can go, look, let's try this. Take the same question and see how Plato answers it and see whether there's a difference and whether the difference can be said in such a way to say that one fulfills the question more fully than the other. Then we'll get an insight into what constitutes an answer. Can you jump in with the Phaedrus? Well, in terms of, of the, the symbolism of the soul you know, being like a charioteer with two horses, is that what you're talking about? No, no, no. <coughs> you mentioned the Phaedrus. Any way you want to take it. Oh, well, what I'm saying, you know, is to me the the idea that there is some kind of, of experience in the material world that has an association with evil or sin or missing the mark is not what the Phaedrus discusses. No, but rather, go ahead. Um, I can't quote it out of, not sure, out of the text, but I just know that it's not this answer. 
<laughs> okay. If I had the favorites here, I could quote it. And I don't want to interpret my understanding. That's okay. Fine. Does Plato offer an explanation? See, even the word explanation, a reason for, a justification for, yeah. any of these words will do. He, he offers for the descent of the soul. I don't. I, I can't. I remember the statement that he says that the, its beginnings begin with bad communication in the upper realms. So what? whatever that I don't. Whatever know. that means. Well, maybe somebody else does. I don't have it in front of me. Well, even but, if you had it in front of you. But here he says that for the intelligence to reason discursively, he he makes a distinction between it appears discursive reason, which leads to the descent as opposed to... Uh, Pardon me, what are you going to do with the first part you offer? Well, I'm saying that there may be a relationship between what, he, what Plato calls bad communication and discursive reason. Okay, there. okay, okay. Look here, at this point we'll take anything, right? But I don't, I don't know. No, 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 no. I'm not knocking your answer. I, I'd like to know if somebody remembers. Okay. Whether they can remember it accurately, at yeah. this point we're shopping for even ideas. Okay. You're putting two notions together. Right. The first one was? Bad communication from the Phaedrus. <clears throat> what, what about bad communication? That that's the beginnings of the descent of the soul. <clears throat> that accounts for the descent of the soul. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Whether it does or not, it's a nice expression. And we want to know how he's using it. Yeah. And the second point you were making, come on how it relates to the intelligence to reason discursively. How does it relate? Well, I'm saying that it sounds like it relates. Bad communication... Okay, wait a minute. This relates to intelligible reason and Dis other things. Discursive like reasoning. Discursive reasoning. Yeah. As opposed to... So she's asking, uh, please help, can we use these ideas in some way to answer the question? So, okay. So, anyone else? Well, it seems like <clears throat> in the Republic, aren't there two descents, at least, that one can speak of? One descent um, into a new reincarnation at the in Book 10, but the other back into the cave that might be more parallel to um, what we're talking about here insofar as it goes, you're leaving the realm of the intelligibles and going down into the realm of the senses. And um, I believe that, um, hmm, can it be said a reason for the descent? A re Again, I think I have a result of the descent is that if you go, you're able to see and evaluate the appearances of justice and beautiful and good better if you come back, if you go back and from, <laughs> Than you could before. You can see a thousand times more clearly. Yeah, that's picking up the sense. Yeah. It's like value right? Yeah. Uh -huh. That going back down, but this this is the other way around. It's because right. of the vision of the intelligible that you can see more clearly the shadows. Right. He's saying mm -hmm. you're sharpened by the experience of the shadows so that you gain a knowledge, a clearer knowledge of the good. Exactly. Or of good, not yes. for good. So Actually, in the Greek, that's, there's a... That's reversed. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, the more you... Okay, you also raised uh, myth of earth. Mm -hmm. Now, look here. <clears throat> Why does the Republic end with the myth of earth? That's the, uh, the myth of error, as it is called, is what happens to the soul as it prepares for its journey after death and how it uh, experiences the upper world and the underworld and how it prepares for its next incarnation. Mm -hmm. So, in the myth of her, each person gets a, a lot which they choose. And then they have to carry that out 
and they uh, <clears throat> there's a guardian that makes sure that you are going to carry it out and, and uh, the daemon as it were is the guardian that's supposed to make sure that you carry out that particular lot you chose and that's your fate but that lot that you choose is a consequence of your education of your education and, and nurture of your preceding existence yeah. right so you carry in Plato all that you have learned, learned and nurtured and you come back to continue that right there's because that, that there's that lovely quote that you can take with you what you see in the dialogue, right? Thrasymachus, yeah. right? Into yeah. your next life. So whatever you yes. learn, you can will change your choice. So then, in this case, then you're saying uh, uh, the incarnation, the descent of the soul, is to continue the path of learning and nurturing. And whatever you've learned, each time you come back. However, whatever you experience is to gain this kind of learning. Gina's quote was saying that you can also pick up bad communication, and that accounts for your your choosing your, worse lives. Right, a, a they worse will have life. less of an opportunity to. Yeah, and also your vision, the journey into Hades. Right. Uh, also, or, or, wouldn't also bad communication say, "I don't know enough." And so I need to go do it again. Okay. I don't the trouble is that bad communication would be, I would think, an I ignorance, right? Yeah. Pardon me. Bad communication would, would be, be an ignorance, get, uh, receiving ignorance. In yes. The, or it's what you've been persuaded of, fa right. false belief. Right. False belief. Right. 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 So for him, your being here is to continue your education, mm -hmm. your paideia. Mm -hmm. right? which is not just formal education, of course. So therefore, it's a positive. Absolutely. Ah, then the descent is not immersing yourself in whether it's sin or martyon or kakos or bad or mm -hmm. evil. Mm -hmm. It's independent of that. Mm -hmm. He's saying we're all here to continue learning. Right. right? Mm -hmm. The more deeper, more profound learning. Until finally, you learn enough to get off reincarnation, which is what he has in the both in the Phaedo and in the uh, myth of Earth. Sir, to get off the merry-go-round. No, it's not a merry-go-round. You're learning. It's a school. It's a paideia. It's not a merry-go-round. I know, but you just keep you know going around. Oh, that's true. That guy keeps going around and around. <laughs> But it's it's not frivolous if you're there to learn and nurture, find something to nurture the soul. Is that right? Right. Oh, now wait a minute. Let's go back. Is this dealing with the question of the descent? Why? Yes. Is that a better answer than Plotinus? Yeah. Why? We haven't gotten Plotinus yet. If it's a better answer, I know how to answer this question. Miss, is it better? <laughs> well, so far, but he just said we haven't gotten Plotinus yet, so I'm wondering well, where are we going to be. <clears throat> well, we that's part of the problem, isn't it? <laughs> is that we're looking for the answer to explain his descent. He's puzzled by it, mm -hmm. and he offers this to the degree to which you've understood it. Mm -hmm. uh, So we can say, we, of course, we need more insight into Plotinus, but given what we have, if we use that, can we contrast two sets of answers, the way in which Plotinus proceeds on this and the way Plato does? Yes. If so, if Plotinus was in pursuing the spirit, he would be more in dialogue. Yeah. Learning, nurturing, Barbara's quote is really important. <clears throat> That's a strange quote in the Republic. 
Could you recall it? That will save me the effort where he's talking to Glaucon. Mm. Somebody's got to have a republic here, right? Oh, okay. okay, okay. okay. Wait, it's, um, I just re- oh, look at this. Magic. <laughs> hey. <laughs> okay, she's going to change the tape. Okay, yeah, good time. I have to change the tape. Pass me the plan. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, that's Page 294. Page 294. In book six. In very truth, Socrates, I think you are much in earnest. However, I believe most of your hearers are even more eager to resist and will not be persuaded at all, beginning with Thrasymachus. Continue with your quote. It's on page 294, the routes? Well, wait a minute, my pages are torn, hold on. 296. No, no, wait a minute. Yeah, that's right, this page was torn. Yes, there we go. Oh, don't say that. Overused. Don't make me, don't make me and Thrasymachus quarrel so soon after we have made friends. But really, we were not foes before. I tell you, I will never give up trying until I persuade him and all the rest, or at least until we achieve something useful toward that life when they shall be born again and there meet with discussions like these. So he is a, he is making a claim for the value of this discussion called the Republic, mm-hmm. and he's saying that if this is the discussion on the Republic, then as much as you get out of the Republic, you return again and again mm-hmm. until you grasp it all. Mm-hmm. That's learning. So he's putting on the class of learning <coughs> his own work, the Republic. Mm-hmm. Oh, right, read the quote again, see whether that's there. Oh, don't say that. Don't make me and Thrasymachus quarrel so soon after we have made friends. But really, we were not foes before. I tell you, I will never give up trying until I persuade him and all the rest, or at least until we achieve something useful towards that life when they shall be born again and there meet with discussions like these. Thank you. Good, good, good. So that's curious, is it not? Now look, would you agree we need a break? Interesting way of and therefore, why don't we the next time do contemplation and then go back to the rest on the, sec- the section on the soul. So contemplation is really a delight. It's a beautiful section on 162. Mm-hmm. And we'll give special honors for those people that memorize it. Cool. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Aurelia, who comes here on Friday night, and uh, uh, <clears throat> Juan Balboa uh, did a book, a little booklet, Right. And uh, hmm. I'll leave it up here for those that want to see it. She did a booklet hmm. on, uh, guess who this was? Oh, or is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Oh, my Can people get copies of it, Pierre? Uh, Can we get copies of it? I don't know. Uh, yes. She just gave me this tonight. Yes, but... You can, but first she wanted Pierre to go through and make sure everything was correct and, sure. and she'll do corrections. Mm-hmm. There are a couple of misses. misses. Okay. Uh, but I thought I'd let you look at her great work that she did. Yeah.
Fun. Very beautiful. Wow. This is and, one uh, Maria. This is Aurelia. Yeah. 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 Oh my goodness. Now this will become part of the congressional record, by the way. That's what right. you did it for. Wow. So, those of you who want to take a look at it, it's up here. Great. Oh, and this is a, uh, a picture of <clears throat> a map case, uh, oh. Russian, a Russian officer's map case out of World War II. Oh. Yeah. What a nice thing. Yeah. Beautiful. When I was in Russia giving a talk at St. Petersburg, uh, <clears throat> When I gave my talk, I introduced it by saying that uh, during the service, when I was in Italy at, at Casino, we kept wondering about what was going on in St. Petersburg, which was then, of course, Leningrad, because they were holding out against the German onslaught. And they enjoyed that story, but then I added to it, I said I'd very much like to uh, pay my respects to the, to the great cemetery, because they lost many, many, nearly a million people. And uh, as a consequence, a couple of people there thought I was doing very well, and they gave me this mm. Russian lieutenant's map case, and that's a picture of it. Mm. Uh, so, time for a cup. Gift. <coughs> <coughs>